this is Corey Rashawn with Double E Productions, DPVN, and In Too Deep. We are actually on the phone with Dante James. We are going to speak to him about his career in film um, and get to know him a little bit more. Dante, how are you today? Hi, Corey. I'm fine. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. You're very welcome. I'm actually the one I think who's uh, in, in great company here today. Um, introduce yourself to, our, to the audience. Let them know who you are and what it is that you're involved in and what you do for a career. I'm an independent filmmaker, uh, and I have uh, taught at several universities, the University of Dayton and at Duke University. I served at Duke University as an artist in residence for seven years, um, and uh, I've been teaching at the University of Dayton for the last two years. But more importantly... I think, is uh, the filmmaking because it's important for us to have independent voices that interpret our story and our culture from our point of view. And that is my major focus. Um, and expand on why it's important. Um, you know, I've been having some conversations with artists Um, that have been centered around whether Michael Jackson should be played by a a, a white person or a black person, and it's just art. You know, then you have Hamilton on stage, which is a a total hip-hop rendition of uh, the life and history of uh, Hamilton. Um, So what is it, why is it important, uh, the storytelling, and maybe how that story should be told? Well, I think it has several levels to it. One level is in the context of us telling our stories and interpreting our culture from inside of the culture and uh, from a real experiential point of view. That's totally different from someone having an appreciation uh, for the culture and trying to access our stories externally. It's two totally different things. By telling the story from inside the the culture, it's it's not observational. It's experiential. And it it gets to emotion and, and, and... and feeling and, 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 and spiritual connections to our history and our culture. I think that's really, really important. Second of all, I think that, uh, but to get to that point, uh, we have to find and put in place the financing structures, be it funding or investing, you know, that allow us, to tell our stories uh, unencumbered by outside forces and sources. I mean, this is not a new, this is not something that's new. Uh, if, you, if you look at the historical record, uh, uh, one will see that one of the differences that Richard Wright had with Zora Neale Hurston was the fact that she had a white patron who was funding and supporting her art. And her art was all grounded in our culture. And the argument was that clearly the the support from this white patron had to have an impact on her interpretation of our culture because that was the source of, of her funding and consequently, either consciously or subconsciously, right, right. it had an impact on her interpretation of the culture. So it's, right. it's not an old argument, but I think that um, as media evolves and becomes even more uh, powerful in contemporary society, I think it's an even more important question. Right, right. I totally, I totally agree. Um, especially with the support of uh, 
funding. I've heard many stories in my lifetime, um, you know, being a journalist and a reporter and um, taking in stories from people uh, who had to change their script because of the outside funding. Um, you know, I understand everybody wants to make money, but I, I really think that the strongest value is in the content uh, more than the making of the money uh, from the content. Um, have you experienced the same type of um, uh, issue um, or hurdle of getting projects funded where you've actually created the story from the inside, but the external forces um, or the external funding, let's just say, um, because they're not a part of the community, wanted you to create uh, the story from the external side? Absolutely. I mean, it was um, a journey to get to the point where um, I am now as a uh, struggling <laughs> independent filmmaker trying to form the appropriate partnerships and also find my own resources because I want to make my films unencumbered by outside funding sources. Uh, for instance, um, for many years, I made films uh, within uh, the PBS system. And um, because that system, uh, starting out, my impression was a um, purer system. Um, but over the course of years and various experiences, it became apparent to me that PBS, this is not a criticism of them, it's just a reality, right. um, has, they have their own particular funding structures. They have their own particular uh, uh, agendas. The foundations that they interact with have uh, their own uh, agendas and, 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 and political points of view. And uh, when you have funding through those entities, they play a part in, uh, in the editorial content of a film. And I am at a point now in my life where as an African-American male and as an activist, as an artist, and a filmmaker. And in terms of where we are as a people, not only in this country, but throughout the world, mm -hmm. I feel that I have to make and I want to make the strongest statements possible in the context of our struggle and how I interpret our struggle. And exterior funding has a way of having a major impact on how strong those statements can be. Right, right. And, and yeah, well, I think we all kind of know there's a fear in, in having the black narrative created. Um, at least that's my interpretation of... Um, you know, creating real stories. Now, I, 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 I have a question, too, because when you're taking your films that you make and placing them in a lot of these film festivals, um, isn't the entities around some of these, even the black film festivals, um, they're also outsiders as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, um, um, unfortunately not only black film festivals, but um, uh, African-American owned and operated mainstream media mm -hmm. has, taken, has taken on many of the same characteristics that corporate mass control, mass media has taken on. Right, and right. that's what they look for, unfortunately, in a number of the film fakers, film festivals, and that's also what they look for in terms of uh, in terms of investments. Right. So it's a um, it's a um, 
a difficult task. Yeah. You know, yeah. now here's a, here's what I think is a perfect example. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, first of all, I have a, a great deal of respect for Don Cheadle. He's yeah. an incredibly gifted actor who is committed to ourselves, our, our being black people, history, and our culture. His track record is unquestioned. You know. However, the recent film that he just made on Miles Davis, to me, is a reflection of exterior influence on content. And by that, I mean because of, and he's spoken about this, because of the problems he's had, he had getting the film funded, okay, uh, the marketing people and the finance people, okay, uh, wanted him to have a, um, a well-known white lead in the film. Mm-hmm. So instead of just telling Miles Davis's story, they came up with a fictional situation and turned it into a, in Hollywood's context, a buddy film, a racial buddy film. Mm -hmm. And that was, in my mind, unnecessary because Miles Davis is absolute, was, was an absolute genius. Yeah. And uh, the narrative arc of his story, you know, um, is not only speaks to his genius, okay, but it speaks to uh, uh, the, the evolution and the arc of uh, his interaction with mainstream society as an African-American male. Okay, and it tells you more about um, this society as a whole, okay, right. within the context of his story. But right. the fact that they came up with this, turned it into a buddy film, I think is a reflection of how what happens when outside funding sources, mm-hmm. okay, have an influence mm-hmm. on the content of our history and culture. Right. Strict control, I say. Um, I think the same thing happened with the James Brown movie. Um, if, when you bring it up and you talk about this whole buddy aspect of it, I... I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I th- I, you know, that, that might be an equally good example. Mm-hmm. When I went to see the James Brown's movie, I was absolutely appalled by the opening of the film <laughs> where... They had James Brown upset mm-hmm. because some woman had used his private bathroom and didn't flush the toilet. Right. Okay. So that was the device that they used to introduce James Brown mm-hmm. okay, was, was to this mass that. media film-going audience. Right, right. You know, right. and that is an external interpretation and introduction to James Brown. Right. Now, for people, for black people, you know, what we think of in terms of a framing device for James Brown is the film, is, 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 is the song James Brown singing, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Right. You know. Right. And to me, that's the way, that would have been my entry into the film and, and, and a perfect framing device for James Brown and what he meant to black people and how he defined himself and his place within the context of American society. That's a perfect example. I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, yeah, thank you. But, um, yeah, you're, yeah, that would have been interesting to see. And... Uh, yeah, the angry black man, or the, the it's you know kind of what I call this still the the cooning of our films, um, and how we're portrayed. And I I see, but but it was it was it, it was not an African American filmmaker. No, no. The same filmmaker who gave us the help. Mm, right. And clearly the help was problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. in the help, they framed 
the domestic workers in the South as the support Mm -hmm. of the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. It was the domestic workers who were going into the churches and cooking for civil rights uh, workers. It was the domestic workers who were giving them places to to, to right. stay when they came yeah. south and when yeah. they were working, you yeah. know. It was domestic workers who were uh, uh, doing the mimeographs and, 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 and printing the flyers and so forth, right. you know. Right. And they framed these black women as passive victims. Mm-hmm. 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 And clearly that's not an accurate interpretation of the history. Uh, which is what the movement is about, you know, in too deep is, you know, created to address all this, to have the conversation. Um, I know that you're on the panel for the industry we all talk. We just got a nice little snippet, to tell you the truth, um, about how that conversation is going to go. So um, I have to cut you here. We don't want to give out too much. We want people to come uh, to the network on September 24th to, in, uh, to dpvm.net. Um, we will be streaming live. You'll get a chance to listen to Dante uh, James talk and also ask him some questions from either Facebook, Twitter, um, or uh, we're also working on a chat with our strategic partner, Let's Buy Black 365. So, Dante, thank you very much thank for you. this brief introduction of who you are and where you're coming from on this platform. We're looking to do more with you um, from DPVN and really bring some future projects to the network. If, if not that way, definitely highlight uh, some of the projects that you have. But, you know, we're, we're looking for the positive on DPVN here. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You got it.